what can make uh, these deductibles go 500% up? I mean, it's unjustifiable. His building's deductible is now $150,000. Experts warn it will only continue to rise. That's going to compound every month as more and more buildings and properties renew their policies. Uh, at the outset, it's a pretty good chance that this is going to affect probably eight to 10,000 strata corporations across the province, if not more. A statement says the government continues to engage with the private insurance industry to determine how, in the face of climate challenge, British Columbians can continue to access affordable insurance coverage. It's a nationwide issue, but... Well, if we compare it to other provinces and other jurisdictions, BC is by far getting the worst of it. Currently, there is no limit to how high a deductible can go. There's hundreds of pieces of legislation that uh, the insurance industry is, is subject to in each province. Some is provincial legislation, some is federal legislation. Uh, but, but certainly deductible amounts, it's, it's not legislated for a maximum amount that I'm aware of. A lack of insurance companies is being blamed for the hikes. Property costs and insurance claims have also played a role. Meanwhile, owners like Maestra say all they can do is hope they get coverage before it's too late. I'm constantly thinking about it and it's stressful. It is really stressful. Estefania Duran, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, a complete SkyTrain shutdown was narrowly averted this morning, and that came as a relief to thousands of commuters. I wasn't sure what I was going to do, so I was going to do car to go maybe, but it was pretty last minute. I just woke up this morning and saw it was still running, so I'm really happy about that. They should talk about this thing way, way before they come to this point. I mean, they, when they come to hold us hostage like this, it's not fair. Um, it saved me about an hour's worth of commute, so I'm super happy. <laughs> The tentative deal between the workers' union and their employer was reached early this morning with only minutes to spare before the deadline. Expo and Millennium Line saw an hour delay while workers got the systems booted up. This is a very good outcome for our customers. This is a good outcome for this region. And of course, this is a very good outcome for BC RTC employees. Feeling good, but feeling tired. The Expo and Millennium Lines link the cities of Vancouver, Burnaby, New Westminster, Surrey, Fort Moody and Coquitlam. QP7000 members voted 96.8% in favour of job action after talks broke down. The workers' contract had expired at the end of August. And we are learning more about why an elderly man in a scooter plunged down a SkyTrain elevator shaft last night. Police say witnesses saw the man use his scooter to ram the closed elevator doors at Yale Town Station. TransLink police think the ramming was intentional, but that the incident actually managed to jam the doors open. That's when the man fell about nine meters onto the top of the elevator below. Elevator technicians are continuing to investigate why those doors opened. The man escaped with what fire crews describe as bumps and bruises. There's a new plan tonight to try to remove dozens of illegal campers from a park on Vancouver's downtown east side. The park board is changing course, saying it will now seek an injunction as a first step in getting people out of Oppenheimer Park. The CBC's Leanne Young joins us live with more. Leanne, first, what has the park board decided to do? Well, it's decided to hire an outside agency to assess the situation and make recommendations on what they should be doing. We're talking about a nonprofit group, someone that's already working in the downtown east side. Park Board Manager Malcolm Bromley says the city doesn't have the expertise to deal with the issue. The role of the city, uh, the housing advocates and people in uh, community services, is working with individuals on housing solutions. This is now a community. This has become a collective dynamic that is uh, unique and requires uh, kind of a community development engagement approach collectively with the group. The third party will be asked to look at issues of safety, shelter, reconciliation and camper engagement. Right now, Bromley says there are about 30 to 35 people sleeping there overnight regularly. The park board also plans to revise bylaws so that it becomes legal for people to camp overnight in parks when they have no other choice. Once those conditions are met, then they'll be able to seek an injunction from the courts and that will force people to move out of the park. It's quite the change of heart. Just about two months ago, they faced 
pressure from the city, police and fire departments to do just that, and they refused. Quite the change of heart indeed, Leanne, and this has been happening for quite some time, so why now? Well, Park Board Chair Stuart McKinnon says because it's getting colder, there are concerned people may be bringing in heating devices, which creates more hazards, so they're taking additional steps. The goal is voluntary decampment. As for timeline, the board says they're hoping for before next spring. They're expected to announce the third-party group before the end of the Mike, month. Mike Kanita? Leanne Young, thanks very much. You're welcome. A coalition of Indigenous leadership and environmental advocates is demanding the federal government release an updated cost estimate for the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion. Um, the refusal uh, of the government to talk about where this $500 million number came from, I think those have all built towards the momentum of answering this question, but the question has been there for a long time. The coalition includes the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, West Coast Environmental Law, environmental groups Stand Earth, and the citizens group Dogwood. The group is saying since Canadians became the owners of Trans Mountain, it is harder to get up-to-date financial information about the project. Nothing has changed in, in terms of um, the, the reasons to oppose this project. And the financial viability continues to unravel. According to the coalition, that last estimate placed the cost between $7.4 billion and $9.3 billion to twin the existing line. In an emailed statement, the Crown Corporation spokesperson said Trans Mountain can't predict when it'll have an updated cost estimate for construction. Vancouver police are looking into multiple shoplifting incidents this holiday season and using it as a reminder for shoppers and retail workers to stay safe. It is an issue which we're trying to deal with. We want the public to be aware that shoplifting is happening in our city, especially over the holiday season. We want people to be aware that if they notice anybody criminal behavior happening to call 911, if people are being violent to call 911. Our loss prevention officers do a great job in our city and we don't want them getting hurt. We want them to be aware that these thieves are out there and they can be violent. On December 6th, police arrested 20-year-old Tyler Fitzpatrick for stealing alcohol and pulling a knife when confronted. And on December 8th, Andre Gudrea and Patricia, uh, Patricia Dove were taken into custody for stealing and using bear mace to threaten loss prevention officers. And the busy holiday season is almost here. And this is the first time Canadian travelers will be armed with new passenger rights. But as Jacqueline Hansen tells us, they're already concerned that the airlines will find loopholes. The countdown is on to the next wave of airline passenger rights, especially at Canada's busiest airport. Oh, it's great. The idea of getting compensated hundreds of dollars for my delay, my time is worth that, so I like it. Under the new rules, if passengers are delayed for more than three hours, major airlines such as Air Canada and WestJet will be on the hook for between $400 and $1,000. But there are exceptions. Airlines won't have to pay if a delay or cancellation is due to weather or if an aircraft has unplanned mechanical maintenance. While most travelers no doubt prefer safety over speed, some are concerned airlines won't admit when a disruption is their fault. I think we're going to see a lot more mechanical problems versus what we probably were seeing before. And critics say the Canadian rules fall short of those in the European Union, where most delays due to mechanical issues are covered. We think that that's a loophole uh, that the, the carriers may take advantage of. The Canadian Automobile Association helped consult on the new rules on behalf of travellers. We give the package that's come out about a 7 out of 10. We think it's got a lot of good stuff in it, uh, but it's far from perfect. But the National Airlines Council of Canada warns that the new rules will increase costs for airlines and in turn will push fares higher for consumers. Smaller carriers such as Sunwing, Porter and Flair will be responsible for smaller payouts between $125 and $500. The compensation should never exceed the price of the ticket for one thing. The group that represents them says that's still too much. It has to be a, co a compensation and not a windfall for the passengers because you're just fragilizing the, the airlines if you're just being ridiculous in terms of, uh, of levels of compensation being paid out. But critics say it's a cost of doing business. The carriers 
have always said that they've had their own internal policies and that they do compensate people under some circumstances. If that's true, they shouldn't really be paying out much more now than they were before. If airlines break the new rules, the fines will be much higher than any passenger payout, $25,000 per violation. And the Canadian Transportation Agency says it will be tracking flights to make sure that travellers who file for compensation and deserve it get paid. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Yeah, a lot of people saying it's uh, long overdue. Mm -hmm. uh, your worst delay? I've had a lot of bad delays. Mm -hmm. um, one that stands out, I was stuck in Chicago O'Hare coming from here, going to Washington, D.C. Stuck there for about 24 hours, and my trip was only supposed to be three nights long. So I really was only there for like a night and a half. But or, weather or mechanical or uh, just? The whole airport was shut down. Weather. Right. So yeah. in that case, this You're doesn't, yeah. Completely. A couple of notes on this. Uh, the onus, as she said, uh, is, is on the passenger mm -hmm. to make the claim if you feel that uh, you have had a, a too long a delay. Uh, and also, as of Sunday, the airlines will be required to seat children near their parent, parent mm -hmm. or guardian. Yes, if the child is under five years old, they have to be in an adjacent seat. If they're between 5 and 11, they have to be in the same row, no more than a seat apart. And if they're 12 or 13, they have to be within two rows of their parent or guardian. Until now, airlines had their own policies but were under no obligation to follow them, prompting some families to pay extra to make sure they were seated with their children. Call at Kennedy back with us again tonight with a first look at the forecast. Thank you, Mike. Well, boy, we are into it, aren't we? Just a series of systems that will be moving through and having an impact on us through most of the week. Now, it doesn't mean all the time, but still quite a bit of precipitation. Light so far, but we'll see that intensity increasing. So one system after another, primarily showers, but we will get into more significant rainfall. And that comes in, it's more like drizzle through the overnight tonight and early tomorrow if we see anything. But later in the day on Wednesday, we're looking at 10 to 20, maybe even 20 millimeters of rain by the time we get into Thursday and then another system beyond that the temperature trend though in general is on the mild side although I think you tend to notice that more with our overnight lows than our daytime highs because they're only running a degree or two above seasonal in terms of this system that's having the impact over the next 24 hours another one to come but as you see kind of early this is 6 a.m. on Wednesday Cloud cover, yes, some drizzle in there, certainly that risk into the afternoon hours. We get more into a soaking rain as we go towards the overnight. So that's just the next one. There's yet another one after that, which I'm going to talk about coming up. But your forecast for overnight tonight, the low, just five degrees, six degrees tomorrow morning. Could be a little bit of patchy fog. So again, a few areas with some reduced visibility. But as the winds pick up, that will actually improve that. And then eight degrees as we go into the afternoon hours. So we'll talk about the next one to come in just a little bit. Dr. Brent, thanks, Colin. And a reminder, you can watch this newscast live on CBC Gem. The free app is also where you can find other CBC programs. And CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. It is being called a win-win-win. A new free, free trade deal is reached between Canada, the U.S., and Mexico. Coming up, how the three countries suddenly ended up on the same page. Thanks so much for sticking with us through this break. Your exclusive content tonight, can you do the shrimp squat? Have I you tried? Think so. All right, it's the latest <laughs> fitness trend on social media. We'll make you do it after. And it was started by an Ontario woman. Yes, it was. Her name is Melissa Capaletti, and her move has gone viral, inspiring thousands to try it and making for some rather hilarious moments. She spoke to CBC's Ali Chason about her newfound fame go to TikTok or any social media platform and type in hashtag fitness challenge. Yep, that's her, the top trending video. And boom, she's gone viral. Hundreds of thousands of likes, six point something million views and counting. I am about to meet this Mississauga fitness maven to try that squat out myself. Wish me luck. Okay. So all you do is you're going to go down into a half kneeling position. Okay. Perfect. Then you're going to grab your back foot with both hands. Okay. Perfect. I'm with you this far. Yeah. And then all you do from here is lean forward. You want to drive through the heel of your foot and then you just stand up. 
Okay, you make it look so easy. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, one, two, three. And I'm stuck. And then one, two, three. There's a couple things we can do if wow. you can't quite get it. Okay, first thing you can do is take one hand away. It acts as a little bit of a counterbalance, helps you get up. Still really tough here though. You're gonna put this underneath your knee. Okay. And then now you simply just have less distance to travel. So it makes okay. it easier. So this is a good option for people who wanna work their way up. Exactly. Okay. Like me on TV. Wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Arms back. I'm gonna use this little cheat here. There you go. One. And just stand up. Two. Three. There you go. There you have it. Practice that for a little bit. Get a little closer to the floor and you'll get it. Cool. It took a minute to film and post and I didn't think too much of it. And then, yeah, it just took off because people loved it, I guess. And I had like a million views before the end of the day that day. The comments are hilarious. I wish I could read them all. Like there's too many, but they're so funny. Um, and I think it's so cute watching everyone's attempts, especially like the younger generation, because uh, part of what I do is I work with youth athletes and I think it's so important to develop like a healthy relationship with fitness at a young age. So I think making fitness fun is really, really important and these kind of challenges are a great way to do that. Yeah, I got like a few like Instagram DMs of like, oh, this was so hard, I couldn't get it at first, but I kept trying and like they finally got it and like that's super rewarding because I know how it feels because I do the same thing. I'm always trying to learn new skills and when you finally get it, it's like the best feeling. Okay, as someone who's into fitness, I'm really excited to try this. I, I tried it at work, the floor was too hard, hurt my knee. Excuses, excuses. I'm trying it at home We'll tonight. expect a full update tomorrow. Okay. I just pulled several You're muscles watching it. You're not even gonna try it, it so. Back we'll be back time. in a moment. Well, after years of negotiations, elections, and all kinds of political drama between Canada, the U.S., and Mexico, all three countries have signed a revised new free trade deal. It is something Canada is calling a win-win-win, and the U.S. is describing as nothing short of a miracle. Katie Simpson explains what happened to suddenly get everyone on the same page. There had been great doubt this moment would ever happen, that an agreement was possible after closed-door shouting matches, name-calling, broken deadlines, and squandered goodwill. But they made it. This has been a long, arduous, and at times fraught negotiation. We made it to the finish line because we learned how to work together. It's nothing short of a miracle that we have all come together I think that's a testament to how good the agreement is. Trump's top man on trade had to find consensus both at home and abroad. Robert Lighthizer accepted demands from the Democrats in exchange for a promise to pass NAFTA through Congress. In terms of our work here, it is infinitely better than what was initially a pope, a proposed by the administration. Nancy Pelosi asked for a change to make it easier to lower prescription drug prices and demanded new ways to monitor working conditions in Mexico to make sure labor and environmental standards are being met. Ideas Canada says it had been pushing for from the start. It is with great satisfaction that I see quite a lot of those positions actually being part of the amended agreement that we all signed today. It was more than just progressive ideas that led to this breakthrough. Mexico accepted deep concessions. So much so, the Americans tried to ease their pain by awkwardly gushing over the Mexican president. I am so proud to be here and honored to be here with the president of Mexico, who, who is this historic figure. And I want to give my best wishes again from the president of the United States, who is a truly historic figure also. CBC's Katie Simpson reporting from Mexico City tonight. The path to ratification of the new NAFTA deal is bound to be a slow one because it's safe to say the deal is low on the priority list for the U.S. Congress. That's because the impeachment proceedings against the president continue to be front and center in Washington, D.C. As Susan Armiston reports, today the Democrat leadership unveiled two arguments against Trump, abuse of power and obstruction of Congress. 
Straight up and somber, the Democrats moved to impeach the President of the United States. The President's continuing abuse of his power has left us no choice. Adam Schiff, whom Trump calls Shifty Schiff, turned the tables. Why don't you just let him cheat in one more election? Why not let him cheat just one more time? Trump faces impeachment on two charges, abuse of power and obstruction of Congress, both related to his pressuring Ukraine to investigate a political rival for his own personal gain. Trump called the charges weak and political madness before Republicans took aim. You know, back in 2016, the Democrats called those who supported Donald Trump deplorables. And now they're trying to disqualify their votes. Formal charges set in motion a series of votes this week and next, which could make Donald Trump the third American president to be impeached. All of us commenting on it. Bizarrely, the second one popped up today supporting a vote. Congress is doing what they believe is right. The American people will see. Uh, is it true? And is it what they say? And is it then what should be done with it if it's true? Meanwhile, the rest of us should go about our lives. Strange how these two leaders could intersect in such an unflattering way. Stranger still that Russia sent its top diplomat to Washington today of all days to meet the Secretary of State publicly. We also spent a fair amount of time talking about Ukraine. And meet privately in the Oval Office with Donald Trump. Tonight in Pennsylvania at a rally, the U.S. President stands charged with impeachment and very defiant. Today, the House Democrats announced these two flimsy, pathetic, ridiculous articles of impeachment. So the White House strategy, denigrate the impeachment process, keep an eye on those battleground states, and prepare for a trial in the Senate in January. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Washington. China's foreign ministry says the cases of detained Canadians Michael Kovrig and Michael Spatmore have now been transferred to authorities for prosecution. The Trudeau government says it is doing what it can to free them. It's been a year. Uh, our heart goes out to them. We have, it's our top priority. I know that, that uh, ministers have been working hard uh, to secure, uh, secure their release. Uh, I know they've had consular access, but it troubles me uh, that they haven't had any access to legal counsel. The transfer means the two Canadians could now face trial on charges related to national security. Both men were arrested and taken into custody in China last December. Conservatives want a special committee hearing to review Canada's current economic, legal and diplomatic relations with China. Well, it's widely believed Kovrick and Spatvor's detention is linked to Canada's arrest of Meng Wanzhou. But while the outlook for the two Canadians looks as grim as ever, Meng's defense team has soared, scored a significant victory. She has won the right to access more documents regarding her arrest. Meng's defense suggests they'll reveal police conspired with the FBI to violate her rights. The judge was clear that remains to be seen, but the claims are serious enough to be examined. Her extradition hearing begins in January. To Ottawa now, and Justin Trudeau looking to mend ties with the West. He met with Alberta Premier Jason Kenney today. And as the CBC's David Cochran tells us, Kenney took the meeting as an opportunity to make a number of demands from the Prime Minister. They are political rivals, political opponents, trying hard to work together. We talk about uh, the very real challenges facing Albertans uh, through uh, no fault of their own. As you know, we've been down here for the past couple of days with what I call Team Alberta, eight ministers and 11 deputy ministers. We're here on Parliament Hill. Kenny brought a big team and a big list of demands. Some the Prime Minister won't meet, some he just might. The Prime Minister uh, was willing to listen to our case and indicate an openness on a number of issues. That openness has some limits. Kenny wants Trudeau to scrap liberal environmental laws he says are crippling the oil patch. That won't happen, but they could be tweaked to make life easier for the energy sector. He's indicated an openness, uh, and we, we appreciate that. The Prime Minister reiterated the government's openness to talk about implementation. Trudeau's Western advisor says there was common ground on those environmental laws and on finishing the TMX pipeline expansion. It was respectful and it was intelligent, and there was an exchange among leaders of uh, such an important province and the government of Canada. 
So the words were nice, with both sides turning down the temperature, but one side keeping up the pressure. As Kenny made it clear, he's looking for action. The next few weeks will be critical in determining uh, the seriousness of this federal government uh, to respond to the deep and legitimate concerns uh, in Western Canada. The next test comes when Canada's finance ministers meet here next week. On the agenda is Alberta's request for Ottawa to find a way to support oil producing provinces financially. That request has the backing of all of the provincial governments. They just need the federal government to say yes. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. To New Zealand now, where more details are emerging about what happened on White Island after a volcano erupted. As Stephen D'Souza reports, 25 people are now listed in critical condition there. Their injuries described as severe and horrifying. Steam and smoke continue to rise into the clear blue sky above White Island. On the ground, a blanket of ash covers part of the landscape as a helicopter team searched for signs of life. Newlyweds Lauren and Matthew Yuri were on their honeymoon, touring the volcano before it erupted. They survived, and Matthew left his mother a voicemail that shook her. Terrified, any horrible emotion you can imagine. I hung up and quickly called him back, and at least got to hear his voice, that he was at the hospital, that his hands were severely burned, he really couldn't use the phone. In the immediate aftermath of the eruption, helicopter pilots rushed back to save dozens of people. New Zealand's Prime Minister praised their efforts. I want to acknowledge their courage and their immediate efforts to get people off the island. Those pilots made an incredibly brave decision under extremely dangerous circumstances. <coughs> Eight bodies remained on the island. Authorities say all are now presumed dead. Recovery teams can't land until the island is deemed safe. We cannot put other people in jeopardy to go out there until we're absolutely certain that um, the island is actually uh, safe. Scientists monitoring the volcano say tremors have increased since this morning and another eruption is a possibility. The Prime Minister says the priority now is the survivors. Their absolute focus um, at the moment is ensuring that we have the very best care for those um, who were uh, injured uh, uh, as a result of the eruptions. Those killed or injured in the eruption came from Europe, the US, China, Malaysia, New Zealand and Australia. Most were passengers on this cruise ship, which stayed in port during the chaos and left today. It's hard to find the words for it, to be fair. Um, just wanted to send our love and our compassion. Authorities say a criminal investigation is underway though it's not clear who is to blame, as the world asks why tourists were allowed to visit such a dangerous site. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. A new national survey shows one in five Canadians experience discrimination in Canada. So where do Vancouverites sit? Some say the city has a long way to go. That's after the break.
Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. We've seen the costs depending on your building, your location. We've seen them anywhere from double to triple to even quadruple in some areas. Condo owners are grappling with a big spike in insurance costs. Deductibles are now as high as $100,000 or more. We are optimistic that this is a way forward and that we can work toward a resolution to this situation. A new plan to remove dozens of illegal campers from Oppenheimer Park it includes using an outside agency to help find shelter alternatives. Seeing it take off, fly, land, and do it smoothly uh, was like having a fourth child. It was ex that exciting. A short but historic moment this morning as Vancouver-based Harbour Air completed the debut test flight of what aims to be the world's first fully electric commercial aircraft. Well, a new national survey shows one in five Canadians experience discrimination in Canada. But whether you feel like that will improve over time depends on who you are. As Andrea Ross reports, some say Vancouver has a long way to go. I'm not at all surprised. The results illustrate what some already know. The survey shows black and indigenous people are most targeted by racism in Canada. Experiences that shape the way some see their country and themselves. And my daughter, and the most cringeworthy and, and most distressing thing I remember was when she came home and painted her hair yellow because she thought, and by then had decided, that if you're not Caucasian, you're not beautiful. The survey of more than 3,000 people examines attitudes, perceptions, and experiences Canadians have when it comes to race. In BC, almost 75% of respondents believe race relations are better here than in the US. Canadians are also generally optimistic that progress toward racial equality will happen in their lifetime. But for the most part, Indigenous and Black people surveyed don't agree. We want to be equal amongst all people. Compared to the rest of Canada, Ahenakew believes Vancouver is more progressive on issues of race and diversity. You know, I grew up in Saskatchewan and I heard the, the racial slurs like, no Indians allowed. But he says Canadians still have a way to go in not just tolerating differences, but embracing them. There's lots of prideful Indigenous people that want to be recognized for their history, their legends, their oral teachings. They want to say, hey, this is who we really are. Francis believes equality needs to start with Canadians taking a hard look at what multiculturalism means to them. We do bring a richness to Canada, but for some reason, I don't think Canada understands how deeply uh, having us not included has affected the richness of this society. According to survey results, a society more welcoming to some than to others. Andrea Ross, CBC News, Vancouver. On the other side of the country, racism on board a regional flight targeting Indigenous passengers. On a routine trip between Labrador and Newfoundland, two passengers were caught making racist comments about Inuit travellers. Here's the CBC's Jacob Barker on the incident and the fallout. Well, these comments were said loudly and they were about other passengers on the plane. Peter Panashway, who's a former MP for Labrador, was sitting right behind the men and he heard the comments the men were making as an Inuk passenger made his way down the aisle. The guys in front, one of them said, uh, look, uh, there's an Eskimo coming in. And uh, the other guy and, 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 uh, and Tony uh, walked by and the uh, guy said, uh, uh, could you, you know, can you smell them? Panashway describes the men as being drunk and loud. <laughs> he says they also made fun of a woman who was speaking Inuit Moon, her indigenous language. And my view is that if you're going to be racist and, with, and have these views, for God's sake, you know, have them with your family in your, in your own house because it's not uh, very uh, comfortable for minorities like myself who are in the same room when you're spousing these, these uh, derogatory views and very hurtful views. Another woman, Miriam Lid from Nain, shot this video of the men talking. She says they directed their language at her and her father while she was accompanying him on a medical trip. Right away, as soon as they seen me, they said uh, very hurtful words, saying here comes the Eskimos, uh, life below zero. At the time, I, um, I was 
getting very scared because this is the first time I ever expected uh, any racism in my life. And while the men were being served alcohol on the flight, Lid said once they left Deer Lake, a member of the crew cut them off and told them they were being disrespectful and rude. <laughs> Panashaway spoke with Pal Airlines today and asked them to ban the passengers from the airline, and that's just what happened. In an email, the company said that comments like these have no place in our society and will not be tolerated by the company. It also spoke about its history of partnership with Indigenous groups in Labrador and says it will work closely with them to ensure that their flights remain a welcoming environment for all their customers. Openashway well, said that he probably couldn't change these men's views on things, but that comments like these shouldn't go unchallenged. Jacob Barker, CBC News. Happy Valley Goose Bay. Live shot at 6.38, looking at the uh, Viaduct by Rogers Arena, where fans are heading to the hockey game tonight between the Canucks and the Leafs and Cirque du Soleil, of course, uh, on the other side of the Viaduct there. A little rain today, but is it a sign of what to expect for the rest of the week? Colette is back with forecast next. mean winter storm has caused school closures and flight delays in Nova Scotia. Strong winds have knocked out power to about 50,000 people across the province and an extreme high wind warning is in effect tonight. Environment Canada says gusts could reach up to 110 kilometers an hour in some areas. No winds like that here, but there is something else in the forecast. Mm -hmm. Colette Kennedy is here now with a look. Thanks, Anita. Well, you know what? We're looking at the series of systems that are moving through. And as this one has been making its way in, pushing in towards the interior, we are seeing those freezing levels dropping a little bit. Mostly it's been light precipitation that we're looking at even as it pushes inland. But it's the next system that's a little bit juicier and we'll look for more rainfall, certainly for the south coast as this works its way through. More so later in the day tomorrow into the evening and then overnight into Thursday. And so there we're talking about 10 to 15 even 20 millimeters of rainfall and then the next one comes in into Thursday 
pushing in again with more precipitation. So a bit of a break in between, but not really that much of a break, certainly not in the cloud cover, a little bit in the precipitation. As that second one goes on through, we'll see some moderate precipitation for the south coast uh, ranges, but uh, it'll be a little bit lighter as it gets into the interior. Across, this is just a snapshot across the province for you as we look ahead into Wednesday. Eight degrees for Prince Rupert with the rain, Port Hardy, very similar at seven. Whistler, more of a mix, that temperature just above the freezing mark and so look for a little bit of mixed precip there. Cooler readings as we go interior and we're talking about mostly flurries in terms of the precipitation. So that's what I mean by light stuff as well for Prince George where you're talking about a high tomorrow of just minus four. Your five day forecast, we'll get to the seven in just a moment, but what's important here, temperatures running a little bit above seasonal for daytime highs, not much, but it's the overnight lows that are significantly mild. And then finally, if you're looking for some light at the end of the tunnel, it's looked like it comes towards Saturday. We'll get some sunshine or at least a mix of sun and cloud, slightly cooler air also moving in. And yeah, another round coming in for the second half of the weekend. Oh boy. All right. Thanks, Colette. Okay, big deal today. A C plane became an E plane this morning, making aviation history. Vancouver based Harbor Air successfully completed the first flight of a commercial aircraft using only batteries. As Salima Shivji reports, it's part of a long process to get the electric plane carrying passengers. This may look like a normal old seaplane. It's anything but, and it's making history. The world's first test of a fully electric plane that doesn't emit any carbon emissions, very much dependent on clear skies. Pilot, also the head of the airline, who successfully resisted the winds and the nervous anticipation of those watching, despite a charging glitch the night before. I uh, got behind the controls of the airplane. I'm focused on getting the flight done. Um, you know, yeah, I saw people out of the corner of my eye, but it wasn't a focus for me. So it was all sort of business as usual. Only this business is completely unfamiliar. Harbor Air is aiming to become the world's first all-electric airline, a crowded race to green an industry where emissions are rising faster than all other modes of transport. These few minutes in the air took months of hard work, ripping out its mid-20th century guts and replacing its old motor with an electric one, adding big, rechargeable batteries. The plane still weighs as much as if it were loaded with fuel, and its new motor only has enough battery charge for a short flight. That's why it works for the seaplane company that makes short hops into cities near Vancouver. The man whose company designed the motor knows there's a long road ahead, but he wants the electric planes in the air in the next two years. This is the first time this propulsion system flew on this aircraft. What the regulatory body will want to see is that this happens all the time consistently. What happens when things go wrong? The certification process will be bumpy, with Transport Canada entering brand new territory. There will be many more test flights before passengers can also hop aboard a fully electric plane. Salima Shifty, CBC News, Richmond, BC. Great, and it's the future. Well, yes, possibly. I, it just scares me. Well, you know, you're not alone. Um, not to be scared, but the uh, comments online that I was reading about, mm -hmm. people are, you know, it's sort of half and half. People are like, "This is this is the future," and others are, eh, a "Batteries and a yeah." It's, it's it is a little quieter. I watched the tape coming oh, yeah. today. It's a little bit quieter for sure. All right, uh, she is Canada's teenage tennis sensation, and despite her youth, Bianca Andreescu is already a role model to many. We're gonna hear why next.
Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. CBC Vancouver is a proud media sponsor of the Corleone Men's Choir's 2019-2020 season. Get in the holiday spirit with their upcoming production of Christmas with Corleone. And are you looking for a space to wow people for your next big event? CBC Vancouver's studio space is available to rent. For more on these events, check us out cbc.ca slash bc. NHL coach has been fired for unprofessional conduct earlier this afternoon the Dallas Stars dismissing head coach Jim Montgomery after the team became aware of an act by Montgomery this past Sunday a decision was made after an internal investigation that included discussions with the team's general counsel no other specifics have been given though the team does say it was not criminal and had no connection to present or past players former Canucks assistant coach Rick Bonus will be his replacement on an interim basis. Well, Bianca Andreescu was playing doubles today. Well, kind mm -hmm. of. The tennis star was in Toronto making an announcement about the Right to Play program. It's an organization that helps underprivileged kids get involved in sports. And as Greg Ross reports, she also accepted her newly awarded Lou Marsh Trophy. Bianca, congratulations. Thank you very Spectacular. Much. Thank a day after being named Canada's top athlete for 2019, Bianca Andrescu received the trophy that goes along with it. I had a feeling that I could get a chance to hold this trophy, but I didn't think it was actually going to happen. While a lot of the attention was focused on Andrescu winning the Lou Marsh Award, the reason she was actually here was to announce that she's going to be an ambassador for Right to Play. And today she got a chance to spend some time with some of the kids here at Ruddy Mead Collegiate who are a part of that program. This was Andrescu's reception when she made a surprise appearance at a school assembly this morning. It was pretty unbelievable. It was exciting. <laughs> Students also got to meet Andrescu, someone many consider to be a role model. It's very empowering to see a woman win. It's like inspiring because I'm like just two years younger, so like how much I could accomplish if I try. For her to be getting the best athlete in Canada when she is like a 19 year old girl is like Mickey said extremely empowering. These grade 12 students are part of the Right to Play Youth to Youth program. They help organize sports related activities for elementary school kids and that's exactly what they did today with Andrescu's help. We had like five different activities. And Bianca and, helped out. Yeah, she was joining in on the game. She was having fun with that. <laughs> I think it's an amazing organization and uh, I've always wanted to inspire the youth. Andrescu says role models are important, and she had hers with her today. Having amazing parents uh, like mine, uh, they definitely help me stay grounded. I always talk about having good people in your corner. I think that's very important. Uh, Dad's job was to shoot video of the press conference while mom watched Coco, a family dog who clearly didn't like being left out. <laughs> I have Coco in my corner. <laughs> uh, that definitely helps. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. And the Canadian Football League is closer to getting a team on the East Coast after Halifax City Council voted to help fund a new stadium. The 24,000-seat stadium would be built by Schooner Sports and Entertainment. It aims to have it built by 2022. The stadium would also include an inflatable winter dome so the field could be used year-round. While the CFL hasn't officially approved a new team for the Halifax area, Schooner Sports says the CFL support is almost a given as long as they get the stadium built. A Halifax team would put the league at 10 teams and bring balance to the East-West divisions. She brought the music and, of course, some tears last night in Toronto. Celine Dion is back, touring on the road for the first time in a decade. We'll give you a taste of the concert next.
Thank you. Thank you for coming down. Thank you. Thank you for all your generous donations. Thank you for making this year's Open House and Food Bank Day the biggest yet. If you've missed the fun, don't worry, you can still donate until January 1st. We have some breaking news for you. A plane has crashed on Gabriola Island. It happened just minutes ago. Officials report several ambulance and emergency crews are on scene. Witnesses reported seeing a plane on fire. We'll bring you the very latest information as it becomes available. Okay, she's one of the world's most famous entertainers. Now, for the first time in a decade, Celine Dion is taking her show on the road. Yes, the singer's Toronto shows both sold out. She's going to be here in uh, Vancouver mm -hmm. in April. Somebody might be going to that. And as we hear from CBC Entertainment reporter Deanna Savannah Johnson, it's just what adoring fans have been hoping for. unabashed expression of emotions is one of the things Celine Dion's fans have always loved about her. So when, after grieving the death of her husband and manager, Rene Angelil, three years ago, and after her Las Vegas residency ended earlier this spring, Celine seemed ready to re-embrace life. Her fans welcomed her with open arms. And that love was on full display during the Toronto stop of one of her first true world tours in years called Courage. Also on display, those vocal chops. She sings. She doesn't, she's this ultimate performer. She doesn't need an act to back her up. Like, she just, it's her voice. It's her. So, amazing. Yeah, absolutely amazing. I've started following her since I was seven years old, so I definitely grew up with her. The Celine we see now for us in Quebec has always been the Celine that was always there. Um, I think the rest of the world is finally just catching up. Celine Dion is perhaps more out there and in the public eye than she's ever been. You can see her front row at Paris fashion shows. She has her own children's fashion line and has even become a spokesmodel for L'Oreal Cosmetics. But that kind of omnipresence and newfound cool has not necessarily translated into record sales. Her new album, Courage, debuted at number one at Billboard's Hot 200 chart. It's her first number one on that chart in 17 years. Uh, but it plummeted off the top 100 albums, which was actually, it set a record for the speediest drop by a former number one. Not the kind of record you want to set if you're an artist, but it looks like Celine Dion's got uh, nothing to worry about when it comes to her income because her tour is doing great. Since it started in September, it has already grossed more than 30 million US dollars and is poised to break all kinds of records by the time it wraps in September 2020. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Well, I get chills just watching it. I'm very excited to go to the show here. April? Yeah. So, it, 10 years since Vegas stopped? I think it was, that was her last show, yeah, Vegas. Oh, good stuff. Have you ever seen her? Uh, no, but uh, she's, I'm, I'm a fan. Don't worry, <laughs> I'm a fan. I, uh -huh. I, may, I may not go to the concert, but I know she's good. She's good. Uh, okay, that's it for us. Uh, Leanne is here at uh, 11 o'clock tonight, right after the National. Have a good night.